making your free behavior the path. Becoming accustomed to the fact that all we accept or reject, dualistically affirm or deny, such as enjoyment and disgust, happiness and frustration, beauty and ugliness, fear and security, sickness and health, enemies and friends, love and hatred, or whatever, as one taste, thus judgments are reversed. Listen, great being, do not create duality from the unique state. Happiness and misery are one in pure and total presence. Buddhas and beings are one in the nature of mind. Appearances and beings, the environment and its inhabitants are one in reality. Even the duality of truth and falsehood are the same in reality. Do not latch on to happiness. Do not eliminate misery. Now, I, I think that here we have the do not syndrome going on, which I've, I've been an outspoken proponent of, um, or I should say opponent, <laughs> of this uh, saying do not, because you're going to latch on to happiness. You're going to try to eliminate misery. The do not fallacy <clears throat> is something that the translators are putting in there. I mean, uh, maybe I'm being a little bit, you know, overreaching here, but I don't, I don't think that the Tibetans are saying do not latch on to happiness, do not eliminate misery. I'm saying they're probably saying that um, in this state, it's free from the attachment to happiness or the desire to eliminate misery. It's free of those things. And if you see yourself latching on to happiness, perhaps you could release that. But I'm sorry, when I look into the human experience, uh, we can't just, you know, eliminate misery. And we don't even really try. We kind of like our misery. But that's how the human psychology works. Otherwise, the misery wouldn't be perpetuating. So, um, again, I'll say I do not like the do not <laughs> approach. Uh, my theory is that you're going to do these things. Allow them to be within your awareness, okay? And, and you know, I'm, I'm not just randomly spitting this out. It's a plague. It, it, it's throughout the spiritual world. You have videos that say, you're greedy and prideful. Do not do that. End of video. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and implicitly what's happening there on a subtle level is you end up saying, oh, man, I am greedy and prideful. Man. And you just like kind of the Dharma ends up being part of your story. Because you just watch a Dharma video that tells you we're all full of ignorance and pride, but they give you no real solution for that. I say, you shouldn't be doing that. Do not do that. <laughs> and notice how this also kind of uh, contradicts what I said previously. That happiness, misery, all that is, is all one taste. You know. So even if we have the, the happiness and the misery, we just let it be. That's what it's saying. It's not saying do not because any doing that we have is just doing and it can run its course it can exhaust itself but you cannot just do not you cannot do not okay well i think i've i've pretty much uh made that point <laughs> so thereby everything is accomplished attachment to pleasure brings misery total clarity being non-conceptual is self-refreshing pristine awareness and listen this is how to apply the teaching because all virtue and non-virtue acceptance and rejection beauty and ugliness big and small are one in pure and total presence 
Realize that there is nothing in reality to accept or reject. Realize that there is no beauty or ugliness. There is no doing or not doing. There is no center or periphery. See, see what I'm saying here? How it's contradictory when you say do not? It's contradicting itself again. I don't think they're telling you to do not. Because right here it says there is no no doing and not doing. So why did they just tell us to not do? See? Obvious translation error. In the text, the Dharma will usually back you up. So, you know, I, I go out on a limb here and I say, I do not like to do not uh, syndrome. And then the Dharma is backing me up. Realize there is no doing or not doing. So, realize there is no center or periphery. Realize that pure and total presence is without root, basis, or origin. Listen. This is how to apply the teaching. Do not go against what you do. Because doing and not doing are unborn. <laughs> See what I'm saying, guys? No, really. Do not go against what you do. So, their do not is acceptable. So if you're doing, if you're attaching to happiness or trying to get rid of misery, let it be. All right, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. So by knowing this, whatever you do is the unborn reality. Listen, because the way of life lived according to creative intelligence is like space, it cannot be measured or enumerated. Being non-dual, it is beyond the limits of existence and non-existence. This is pure and total presence's way of behaving. Even the five desirable things should be understood as pure and total presence. Uh, at this point, I'm going to stop correcting the nuances of the translation. All right, I think all of you get it, get the points I've been making. So I'll read through this text as it is. And I'll leave it up to you to decode. But right now it says uh, even the five desirable things should be understood as pure and total presence. They should be realized as pure and total presence. Understanding implies concepts. So little things like that, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, I'll, of course, I can't help myself but to critique. But, um, you know, I don't want it to get redundant. So... The five objects of desire and aversion are also pure and total presence. Understand the five causes of sensation to be the work of this pure and total presence. Understand that the three realms and their life forms are the activity of the nature of mind. The way of life which does not recognize the unborn is not the source of the conquerors, I say. Also, listen, I, pure and total presence, the creative intelligence which manifests universes, do not teach to those who surround me a reality that can be affirmed or denied. I do not teach about splitting the unique into two. I do not analyze that which is beyond analysis. I do not correct that which is naturally uncontrived. Let whatever you do or whatever appears just be in its natural state without premeditation. This is true freedom. All right, stay there. Let whatever you do or whatever appears just be in the natural state. Yeah, that the, the scripture is saying that this is total freedom. When you can just let anger, anxiety, all these things. Um, and then you have a kind of free will there where you can choose to act or not. So the way of living according to me, the creative intelligence, fulfills all aims by letting everything be without striving. 
because everything is included within this inner reality, there is nothing to accept or reject. With hope and fear eliminated, anxiety is transcended. Whoever recognizes creativity at work in the state of sameness, where the three times are unborn, is completely beyond verbal understanding or not understanding. So the three times are past, present, and future. This is the teaching of no acceptance or rejection. By practicing the self-liberation, which is without duality, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the castle of antidotes and rejections crumbles. The watchman who attends to the antidotes is destroyed. Antidotes for problems encountered in meditation do not apply here. You are beyond the narrow passage of hope and fear. The spontaneous accomplishment of the state of creativity is without gradual progress and is not based on the three times. Therefore, it is called completely exhausting mundane existence at the level of extinction into reality. That's a long way to say nirvana. <laughs> so we can correlate that with stage three that we have here in the group. If you're, if you're following along with the stages or keeping those as guideposts, it says completely exhausting mundane existence at the level of extinction into reality. That's when you effortless abide and awareness. You're no longer in your condition cycling of karma so the karma begins to spin itself out and that's what, how self-resolution happens so by living this way you necessarily progress in the perspective and meditation yeah so it's the difference between like if you're if you have your finger in the water and you're spinning it that's samsara that's karma that's creating cycles that's ignorance once you recognize awareness, you take your finger out. And so there's still some spinning. Yeah. But it's going to stop because there's nobody in there spinning it anymore. And that's how self-liberation works, okay? Which is at the heart of enlightenment. Um, if, you're, if you have your finger in there spinning, whether it's spinning good or spinning bad, <laughs> uh, you can never really reach enlightenment. So the result, abandonment of hope and fear. Seek for the Buddha nowhere else than in primordial freedom itself, which is rootless and groundless, the pure fact of being aware right now. Listen, the dimension of being is pure and total presence. From pure and total presence comes the dimension of being. Not even a single atom can be contrived. Therefore, the Buddha is not apart from mind. The dimension of the full richness of being is also pure and total presence. From pure and total presence comes the dimension of the full richness of being. The phenomenon which arise from mind have no other form apart from the dimension of the full richness of being. The dimension of apparitional being is pure and total presence. Pure and total presence is the five apparitions. This is no, excuse me, there is no benefiting of beings apart from pure and total presence. Yeah, so that's why when we do the silent dedication of merit, why I kind of uh, went along with that, because to me, resting in the nature of your mind is the ultimate way to benefit beings so our refuge our bodhicitta our guru yoga our offerings our mandala and our dedication of merit is all in the context of dzogchen if if you're following my advice okay um, this is just kind of how I've suggested it, but uh, certainly many other teachers out there taking different approaches and you kind of 
end up fashioning your own approach too, right? So all the Buddhas of the three times do not exist apart from this pure and total presence. The Buddhas of the past have seen and recognized their own minds to be this uncontrived state. Uh, that's a very powerful line right there. What we do in here essentially is read, talk, and hang out, and it all surrounds the view. So the Buddhas have all recognized their minds to be awareness. It's really that simple. And like I said before, your thinking mind is is like constantly flickering and you may even find yourself kind of going in and out of pure awareness. But awareness is like space, okay? It's everywhere. It's just like space, except it has a cognition aspect to it that we typically don't associate with space. So all you have to do is recognize, realize that space of your mind, that other part of your mind. There's nothing to create here, nothing to condition. The fact is, uh, all of the previous Dharma has been there for you to stabilize your mind so you can recognize this space. All the purification practices, all the sitting, many, many hours of sitting are only there so you may recognize this space that's always with you throughout your day. And all four postures of sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. Okay? It's really that simple. And that's why many masters have said, it's so simple, we don't see it. Because awareness is right here in front of us, with us all the time. And we may even have a nonchalant kind of, no, that's not it. No, that can't be it. <laughs> so the present Buddhas, recognizing their own uncontrived minds to be uncontrived, even now are bringing about the welfare of beings. That's right. I, I myself would not have any liberation, any freedom. I'd, I'd be in the confines of my thoughts, like a lot of folks, um, being suicidal, maybe very, very hurt and sad, so so resorting to drugs and alcohol or anger, raging out, you know, all these things, if I didn't have any other option. So for me, it was kind of a necessity to begin to really come into the nature of my mind. And so even uh, the Dharma is benefiting me every day. Uh, Buddha Shakyamuni's Dharma, Guru Padmasambhava, Lung Chimpa, all of them. So recognizing their own contrived mind, uh, the Buddhas are are still bringing benefit to beings, even now. <laughs> the Buddhas who will come in the future will not teach that this self-arising pure fact of awareness was previously contrived. So saying that whether it's past, present, or future Buddhas, they're all going to teach awareness practice. <laughs> it only makes sense, and it's quite beautiful. So this present uncontrived state of contemplation comes from staying on the uncontrived path. Now remember, this luminous space-like part of your mind is always there. It's always purely present. Uh, if it wasn't, you wouldn't be able to have a thought uh, and then remember it. There's a part of your mind that has to be kind of indifferent just as the basis. So it's... It's very powerful because you can remember thoughts, you can remember entire scenarios that you've been through. You can, as I'm speaking right now, have awareness of your body and your emotions and thoughts you're having. Um, so it doesn't get involved with the thoughts, but the thoughts are involved with it. And if you really start to look back, this is your face before you were born. This awareness was with you in the womb. It was there when you were learning how to walk. Uh, this mind of yours has always been there. And it has to be unfabricated, uncontrived, right? Or else we'd have a huge issue in the Dharma. So, therefore, in the sphere of this uncontrived, unsullied reality, the three dimensions of being and their pristine awarenesses are spontaneously present in their own right. Just now, 
and cannot be constructed or taken apart. There's not a single state which is not this vast state of presence. It is the site and home of everything. Wow, I really like that line. This translation is great because they actually translated all of it. Um, that's a wonderful line. It is the site and home of everything. Uh, we're lucky to be hearing this. I'm exploring it brand new with you here. So the, pardon my excitement when I hear some of these wonderful lines, but they're, they're packed with pithy goodness. So remain in this which cannot be constructed or taken apart. Here, it is not necessary to progress gradually or to purify anything. Well, if I am really a Buddha right now, are the six levels of realization present or not? They are totally, absolutely present. And this is another radical part of our group. Uh, I'm very lucky, I guess, to have been a Buddhist all my life. My mom was a Nyingma Buddha, Buddhist in the Palio lineage. I'm still part of the Palio lineage. Pena Rinpoche is my heart teacher. As far as I'm concerned, Pena Rinpoche is the reason why I share teachings. Because um, we made a deal. Yeah. Um, but in my opinion, enlightenment's here. We can start to familiarize with it. And when we're not, when we're creating samsara inside of enlightenment, we we start to see it, and that self resolves. So our creating suffering, our creating anxiety starts to self resolve. Our inferring and imputing falsehoods onto this reality self resolves, and what's left over is enlightenment. So in this group, for sure, I can tell you, uh, we're fully embracing enlightenment, full liberation. <laughs> That which is quite radical because there's always some kind of uh, hurdle like, no, we can't do that until we finish 500,000 accumulations. No, we can't do that because uh, it has to be the Dalai Lama who tells you you're enlightened. You know, uh, there's all kinds of reasons. No, we can't be enlightened because look at my life. You know, I still get angry and I still have sexual desires. So we cannot be. But no, that's that's not how you approach this. You approach it as your anger and your sexual desires are part of the full spectrum of creative energy. You're not concerned with that. You're concerned with coming into uh, the pure cognizant aspect of your mind, the nature of your mind, the awareness, uh, and familiarizing with that to the point where you are home. <clears throat> that line, that previous line, also really signifies why we do refuge, why we take refuge in awareness. Um, it's your home. It's the home of everything. So shouldn't that be our true refuge instead of some fancy Buddha that, that we don't even know? Some Buddha Dharma and Sangha is our refuge. Most people don't even have a Sangha. Uh, they don't have the full curriculum of the Dharma. And Buddha Shakyamuni has uh, 2,500 years ago. He's long. He's not part of this living. Well, he's part of it, but. Uh, it's a kind of vague refuge if, if you compare to awareness. It's vague. Awareness is here. Like, yes, this is my refuge. This is my dharma. And this is my sangha, the oneness of it. Anyway, I'm just blah, blah, blah. And going on and on about stuff. Don't mind me. <laughs> well, if I'm really a Buddha right now, are the six... Yeah, they're totally present. So the sign of this unceasing, self-arising, pristine awareness is the utter clarity of the five sense organs, which is why when we do our silent sits, you don't need to shut anything off. In fact, I invite you to leave the eyes open if it's comfortable for you, and anything that bothers you or if it's overwhelming for you, it's okay. Let it be. The more you let your five senses be, including the whole the whole world, the whole environment, the more you start to uh, really gain a powerful mind. Not gain it, but to see how your mind is there. This is called the level of light everywhere. The absence of any form of attachment or objectification is known as desireless lotus. This state of pure and total presence, which does not arise, 
and is indestructible. I also call indestructible comprehension. So who's calling it desireless lotus? That must have been back in the day. Oh, you know, all the yogis, they call it desireless. It's known. It's well known. Desireless lotus. Oh, yeah, you've, you've reached the desireless lotus, buddy. Let's go celebrate. Oh. <laughs> Maybe they were caught. Call- <laughs> you guys, it's known as desireless lotus. I've never heard that in my life, but let's bring it back. That's beautiful. So, I also call it indestructible comprehension. Self-arising pristine awareness is arrayed throughout my immeasurable true nature. This is known as the level in the integrative structure of pure and total presence, my very self. Oh, excuse me. (laughs) I skipped some. Did I? Anyway, this is known as the level of the intense display. All the phenomena which exist in the integrative structure of pure and total presence, my very self, are known as the level of the great wheel of letters. Sure, why not? So, because form and communication and awareness neither come about nor are they destroyed, This is known as the level of indestructible comprehension. Here, cause and effect are not different. The phenomenon which arise from mind, good and bad, acceptance and rejection, are primordially non-existent. This I call the level of non-differentiation. Hmm. 